Howdy. Welcome to the Texas A&M University College of Veterinary Medicine and Biomedical Sciences Peer Programs STEM Education Series. Today, histology professor Dr. Larry Johnson will present Introduction to Toxicology. Did you know that the potentially toxic substances all around you may or may not cause you harm? Dr. Johnson will highlight the people throughout history who have discovered the effects and uses of toxins. He'll describe the routes of exposure to toxins as well as our body's response to them. And finally, we'll learn about careers available in the field of toxicology. Welcome, Dr. Johnson. Thank you. Today we want to talk about introduction of toxicology. Just a little introduction. Uh, we have some learning objectives. By the end of this presentation, we hope you'll be able to define the word toxicology and learn all the, the list of sources of toxicants. Uh, also to state some of the history uh, behind uh, the study of uh, toxicants. Uh, define some of the detrimental effects uh, both on cells as well as organs. Uh, also list some occupational environmental hazards that uh, may be encountered, <coughs> encountered and to discuss some fundamental concepts uh, and exposure concepts uh, of, uh, uh, of toxicology as well as to find out what toxicologists do and maybe you could be a toxicologist too. So <coughs> if we've defined the word toxicology, it is a noun, uh, it's a study of toxicants. Uh, toxicants are poisonous toxins is what toxicants are. Uh, now uh, toxicology is a branch of science that's concerned with the nature, the effects, uh, and the detection of poisons. That's what uh, toxicology is. In other words, uh, toxicology is a study of the effects of poisons. Now probably toxicology was the oldest scientific discipline because even the earliest humans had to know which plants were good to eat and which were poisonous. So they were practicing toxicology way before um, a toxicology word had ever been spoken. <clears throat> now what are some of the sources of the toxicants? One is the plants. Look at that poison ivy. It's so beautiful in the fall. I've had poison ivy on my arm so much that I couldn't even bend my arm to brush my teeth. I had to brush my teeth with my left hand because of the toxin, toxicants that's in poison ivy. Another source is animals. That little frog, don't lick him, don't eat him. The birds know not to eat that frog either. Poisons in his skin. Also bacteria is the other source. <clears throat> this is anthrax here. We don't want it, but it, they produce poisons that are toxic to us. That's a toxicant, toxin xenobiotic. That's another name for uh, the to toxic chemical that is in each of these different sources, and there are different ones that are in the different sources that we see. Our greatest exposure is from the food that we eat, the plant food that we eat. So that's the greatest source of exposure that we have. And sometimes, as inadvertently, you might get the wrong mushroom, for example, wrong berry, or maybe the liver it, uh, is another possibility. Now, did you know that 92% of all to uh, poisons ca happen at home, where the kids should be safe, right at home? The products which may be uh, the problem are the cleaning solutions, fuels, medicines, glue, uh, cosmetics, right in the reach of the children is usually uh, where they're exposed. Usually two or three years old is the, uh, is the greatest ex exposure uh, uh, age group. <clears throat> Certain animals secrete toxins, toxicants, um, like venom, snake venom, we don't want it. Uh, others transfer infectious bacteria. Have you ever been scratched by a cat before? Uh, and it didn't heal. It didn't heal like as quick as you should have, but if you're scratched by uh, something else, it heals up pretty fast. Not so with a cat, because they have in, a cat has inoculated you with uh, infectious bacteria, uh, which is under their under their nails that occur. Also plants. Here we see poinsettias we love them for Christmas time, but they're poisonous plants that are another source uh, of our toxicants. What about the history of toxicology? 
where have they been studying that? So if we look back 2700 BC, that's before Christ, right? Uh, Chinese journals talked about plants and fish poisons. They knew some things to avoid. And then the Egyptians back in uh, 1900 BC, uh, they had 800 uh, uh, municipal and poisonous recipes. Wonder what they did with those. And then <clears throat> the Hindu uh, medicine includes uh, not only poisons, but also antidotes. So all of a sudden they start thinking about how to counter the poisons that we, uh, that we had. Then the Greeks back in AD, uh, 100 uh, AD, they classified 600 plants uh, for animal and mineral poisons as well. 600 plants. And the person who did that ate these plants because they didn't have a way to detect uh, poisons in there. And so they say, that's what it says, is that this person turned green and died. And that was the scientist that was uh, uh, participating in plant uh, evaluation. <clears throat> also, the Romans used poisons for execution uh, and assassination. And in fact, the philosopher Socrates himself was killed by hemlock. See hemlock below? Uh, for teaching radical ideas to, to youth, like using computers or whatever. Uh, no computer in those days, of course, but some radical ideal uh, that the people didn't like. Uh, also, uh, Islamic authority talked about poisons uh, and, uh, and antidotes, uh, and a Spanish uh, uh, rabbi produced a book, uh, Poisons. This is a, a book that people could use, a first aid book, uh, on poisons and their antidotes. So that, those were uh, along in the history. Also, the father of tox modern toxicology, Paracelsus, uh, he was a Swiss physician, uh, and he came up with a, a, with a revolutionary idea of uh, toxicology, and that is all substances are poisons. There are none that are not poison. The right dose differentiates the poison from a remedy. So we paraphrase that to say the dose makes the poison. Maybe you can say that. The dose makes the poison. That's the most important five words that we speak today. Dose makes a poison. The apparent non-toxic chemical can be poisonous at a high enough dose. And here we can see, uh, here we can see some pain medication. We all take some pain medication uh, before. And on the back of that, it tells you the amount to take, the dose. So even though medicines are poison and it says keep out of the reach of children, it also tells you uh, what dose to take for the individual based on their weight so that the dose can be therapeutic or a remedy for the problem uh, that the individual uh, might have. And that's our next point, is that a high toxin, like a poison, could be therapeutic or, or, or uh, fix the problem uh, at uh, the appropriate dose. Dose makes the poison. You've heard of people overdosing, right? Overdose. That's that dose word. Dose makes the poison. And here we see some lethal dosages. These are lethal doses that will kill a 160-pound person. These are based on uh, rats, not humans, but nevertheless, that's what it is. Salt, right there, one quart. You have it on your kitchen table, don't you? Right with sugar, three quarts. You eat that much sugar and salt, and you won't be there for the final exam. You've heard of people going to college and having binge drinking, binge drinking, alcohol, three quarts, goodbye. You won't be here. Your, your parents won't have to pay any more tuition because that's not beer now. That would have to be liquor. Three quarts, goodbye. As you come down this list, you can see that it becomes more and more potent. Botulism is much more potent than sugar. But the point is, dose makes the poison. That if it's a high enough dose of things that you eat routinely, it can kill you. Do things in moderation is what your mother said. Okay, and here we can see that uh, further along in the history, uh, the Diseases of Workers was a book that was written uh, by a, a physician from Italy. So they were concerned with uh, workers being exposed to things. Uh, and the uh, Spanish physician established toxicology as a distinctive science discipline. In other words, now toxicology was a science. 
uh, just officially called a science. Uh, now, uh, uh, Peter Enrich, uh, he was able to, he worked with stains and tissues, uh, like my histology is what he does, and he was able to, uh, to uh, do experiments on the effects of toxins on living organisms, like bacteria and different things he had exposed to. So the person didn't have to eat the poison, you just did it with the specimens that you were working with, and he was able with the stains to see the effects uh, of the uh, poison. In other words, he saw the toxicity uh, that was being expressed. We had other books along the way too. Uh, Rachel Carlson alarmed the public about pesticides. So second, since the Second World War, we've been exposed to more pesticides. So they kill the pests, of course, but they also get in the water, and so we drink it, and we're exposed to that, and certain age groups, uh, as we'll see, have individual var uh, uh, variation on how susceptible they are to individual. So we want to talk a little bit about occupational and environmental toxicology. So the environmental toxicants, both in the air and the pollution, are substances that are harmful to the environment and also to you as well. Environmental toxicants could be both natural and they could be man-made, okay? The public usually think the ones that are man-made are more uh, harmful, but in reality, both of them are harmful. Five million yearly deaths worldwide due to salmonella and E. coli. Doesn't have anything to do with human necessarily. Also, one half of all the people who ever lived on this earth, you see that earth right there? Ever lived on the earth have had or died from malaria. That's a lot of folks. Natural causes of, of a death to occur. Now Paracelsus, remember him? The father of modern toxicology? Okay, he worked on a miner's disease. Now when miners dig the rocks up, they have the metal in there too, and then they heat the rocks up to uh, make the, 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 uh, make the, the uh, ore uh, to uh, be uh, water, to make it liquid. And so they could pour that off and purify it. Meanwhile, there's vapors coming off, and the vapors is what made the workers sick. And so uh, this is what we want you to do, uh, is to take an observation and then apply it to increasing the health of individuals. So what Paracelsus said, well, uh, if, uh, if vapors can make cells sick, why not make cancer cells sick? And this is the basis of chemotherapy to occur. Chemotherapy, you all know someone has gone to chemotherapy, chemicals that kill uh, 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 cancer cells. He also looked at tobacco. This was snuff, not smoking tobacco. They first did the snuff, and it, they would put it under the lips, and it got oral cancer. So he linked it to cancer. Uh, also, uh, pot uh, links uh, scrotal cancer or skin cancer to chimney sweeps. Uh, I don't know if you remember Mary Poppins and the chimney sweep, uh, but uh, uh, whenever they're inside the chimney sweeping it out, uh, they're exposed uh, to the soot that can't be washed off of certain areas of the body. Uh, <clears throat> diseases associated with specific occupations were seen for a long, long time and recorded but not considered serious because it was not a social concern. So we think that's silly now, right? Uh, but uh, nevertheless, that was the case. So occupations that had a high risk could be healthcare workers. You may get the same disease they get. Remember, that was a problem with the Ebola, okay? <clears throat> and also pharmacology workers or laboratory workers because you're exposed to these toxins and things when you're testing with them. Uh, refinery workers, or rubber workers, or furniture workers, or, or uh, pesticide workers. All these things uh, are, are uh, exposures uh, that can cause uh, uh, toxicity to occur. Uh, another one of those was uh, radio dial painters. Uh, they used to uh, paint the numbers on the clock, as you can see there on the clock face. Uh, so it could uh, be able to see at night. Uh, and so meanwhile, they would take their brush that they painted with and lick it uh, so to bring it out to a point so they could make a better uh, mark on there. Meanwhile, they were swallowing 
uh, the, uh, the, the radium material that was being exposed. Also, the shoe salesman <coughs> in uh, 1950, this is shoe fitting fluoroscope. You see one at the bottom. Uh, in the olden days, uh, they would have the kids put their, their uh, shoe foot inside there, and you could see the bones of the thing. So you could see if the foot, if the foot fit or anything, even though uh, the, uh, the kid may not say that it fits or not. Meanwhile, uh, the, the shoe salesman was there when lots of kids were coming in. So they were exposed multiple times uh, with the, uh, with the uh, uh, kids being, uh, exposing their feet to these things. Of course, it was bad for the kids too, uh, but it's worse for the shoe salesman. Uh, and so, uh, if you've ever gone to the dentist before, you might note uh, that whenever the hygienist takes the x-ray, she's outside, her button's outside. Or maybe you've got a broken arm and went to the hospital, and you note that the nurse is outside the room. She's not there. The whole reason for that, that whole uh, 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 type of behavior is due to the shoe salesman right there that was exposed over and over again, and that's what would happen to a hygienist if they stood there when you got your x-ray and everybody else did too. Also, industrial chemical workers is another one. They're exposed to things for a long time too. And so remember, dose makes a poison. So it's the amount of exposure that you're getting, and that could be in time or it could be in concentration uh, that you're getting. Now toxicity, if we look at some <coughs> words in toxicology, toxicity is the adverse effects that the chemical may produce. And you can see this cell here is a little bit sick. The dose is the amount of chemical to gain access to the body. So that's the dose. Dose is different from exposure. Exposure is a contact providing opportunity. It's the opportunity to get a dose. It's not the dose, it's the opportunity. This guy is jumping out of, off a diving board and he's gonna be totally exposed to that water. But if he doesn't drink it, he will not receive a dose. So dose and exposure are not the same thing. Hazard, the likelihood of a toxicity to be expressed, and I said this guy is in for a surprise. So uh, what are some, some fundamental rules uh, and uh, exposure concepts that we have there? Uh, one rule is exposure must first occur for chemical to be a risk. And we can see that uh, here with this thermometer. There's mercury inside there, inside there, and that mercury is poisonous. The people poison us all the time. But as long as uh, the mercury is inside the thermometer, it's not a problem. So unless you have the exposure, and that glass is preventing the exposure, you will not receive a dose. You break that and then drink the uh, mercury, that's bad. But as long as it's outside of your reach of gaining access to the body, which the glass here is preventing it, it's not. So exposure has to first occur. Dr. Johnson, we have a question for you. They want to know about exposure and dose. Um, when you were talking about the, the diver who would hit the water, but he wouldn't receive a dose. They want to know, can't you receive a dose of a toxin through exposure, like through the skin, or does it have to be ingested through the mouth? Uh, you can <clears throat> you can receive it through uh, the skin too, and we'll talk about the different routes of exposure that can that can occur. Uh, I was just trying to make the point that uh, uh, having uh, uh, in the vicinity is not necessarily the same as getting uh, it. Now, in the right. case of the pool, you do have some chlorine in there, and maybe uh, some other uh, things. As a rule, it's not that that right. problematic. Even if he swallowed it, it probably wouldn't be that <laughs> problematic. Um, so uh, so uh, some rules are you have to be exposed first. And so uh, I, I, if, if that was mercury or something that they were diving into, certainly that would be a big problem. You wouldn't have to swallow it to occur. So you have to be uh, exposed to the thing uh, and to receive the dose. And the magnitude of the risk in proportion to both the potency uh, and the extent of the exposure. In other words, dose makes the poison, is what we want to say. Now, <clears throat> the, uh, the other exposure concepts are that there are different uh, uh, types of, of exposures. There's routes of exposure we're gonna talk about, and that's what uh, this, uh, speak, this uh, questioner was asking about. 
frequency of exposure uh, and the duration of exposure. And that's what was happening to the workers where they were there smelling it for a long, long time. So the routes of exposure, one was ingestion, uh, as I mentioned, uh, water and food <coughs> is uh, how we get, uh, get that in. Uh, also absorption through the skin, as the, the questioner was uh, implying, it could happen. Uh, and then uh, also injection, a mosquito could uh, bite you, you could get a cut, you can get a puncture, a nail could stick in you. Uh, inhalation uh, through the lungs, we can breathe things in, we can bring toxic things in, that's what happened in a minor's disease, was that they uh, breathed in uh, the vapors. But if you look at the pie chart here, you can see that the greatest exposure of humans is what we eat. And as we said earlier on, it's mostly in the, the toxins of the plant foods uh, that, that, we, uh, that we eat. As a rule, we don't eat a lot of toxic animal, uh, but sometimes uh, the, the toxicity, uh, as Paracelsus said, there's nothing that's not a toxin. Uh, even broccoli, there's good things and some bad things in there uh, as well. Uh, there's nothing just good and not bad, it seemed to be. So more uh, exposure concepts are of uh, the exposure of chemicals may occur from many sources. Could be the environment that you're in. Uh, it could be the occupation. Maybe you're a beekeeper and you get stung by bees. Maybe uh, therapy, and, and we see, see this all the time. People taking pain relief and all of a sudden they get addicted to that medication. That is, is problematic. Diet uh, is another thing since that's our greatest exposure you can get it from the diet. Accidental, maybe, maybe you, you didn't know, you, uh, maybe in a car accident, whatever, uh, that you were able to get exposed. It may be deliberate too. That's another possibility. Remember we said the Romans use it for execution, is what they, is what they did. We have another question <laughs> for you, Dr. Johnson. They'd like to know that if you were, um, if you ingested, excuse me, if you ingested a toxin and then or vomited, or they induced vomiting at a hospital, how long would it take before the toxin takes effect? Does the vomiting immediately get rid of it, or would it still cause you to have harm? Okay, that's a good, that's a good thing. We're gonna talk a little bit about that a little later, but vomiting would be a way to get, get it out uh, right away. Uh, and so it all depends upon the amount you got uh, and, and the potency of it, of how uh, how quick it would be uh, working on there. A lot of things are not absorbed by the stomach, and so if you got a, a, a lot of stuff, I would drink a lot of water and then vomit it up. So you want to dilute it out uh, before uh, you get it, but you do want to induce vomit to get rid of uh, as much as you had. I had a, one of my uh, nieces uh, drank a lie out of the commode one time, and they took her to the hospital and induced vomiting in her. So uh, you want to be clear totally, uh, necessarily. Right. Yeah. Okay, so uh, what processes do the body have, what mechanisms, what processes do they have to counter uh, detrimental effects of toxin? When you're exposed, what can the body do to uh, reduce it? One was to vomit, it would be what it could do. One is the redistribution thing. So. Uh, what the body tries to do is to put the toxin somewhere, store it, and it stores it in bones. And so here we can see a bone, a bone, we can see the, where the bone marrow would be on the inside here, that we see the, the bone, that's one source of storing toxins uh, that we can see. Uh, also, uh, the kidneys for excretion, you wanna get rid of it. Here we see a kidney, this happened to be from a cow, so you see lobes on it that look like a kidney being that much, uh, but uh, that's how you excrete things. Uh, whenever the doctor tells you drink a lot of water, he really means excrete a lot of water because that's the way the body gets rid of things. Also, metabolism. You break things down, uh, and that is done uh, in the liver. And here we can see the liver of this dog. There's a gallbladder right there, the liver is one way. You see a little bit of lung right there in that dog. That's another way uh, to, uh, to metabolize things uh, in the lungs. You see the lungs of a horse uh, right here. Uh, and so uh, those are three things to, 
to redistribute it so that uh, it's not such a high concentration because remember, dose makes the poison, so you can distribute it. And this was a problem with the eagles with the DDT because the eagles were exposed to DDT at a, a, a minimum amount of time, but once it was in the body, uh, uh, the, the, the body would try to redistribute it it would put it in the bones and different, store it in different places. So as an eagle lived beyond, it would break down from those places and, and re-expose um, the, the eagle to toxins. And that was a problem with the eggshells, <coughs> with the, the DDT, was that the body in its defense redistributed it, but meanwhile it was able to continue giving a dose from those stores uh, when the eagle even wasn't exposed to uh, DDT anymore, it was exposed to that what it got uh, in the very, very beginning. And so, um, <clears throat> uh, toxicokinetics uh, is both uh, the, the rate of which chemical enter the body uh, and then also what the body does with it uh, to metabolize it and excrete it. So, uh, toxicokinetics. And here we see toxicokinetics is really what uh, uh, toxicants and the body doing it work, that's what it does. And so we can see on the left-hand side where a toxicant, we're exposed to that toxicant, we are, and we receive a dose. And that dose gets in our plasma, <clears throat> that is in our blood, the liquid of our blood, uh, and the body tries to store it. It stores it in fat, it stores it in bone, it stores it in, in, in uh, plasma proteins. It stores it there to try to dilute it out. Also, some of it will go uh, to the liver that we see. And that's a side of action where it, it tries to modify it. We'll see in a minute how it does modify it. Uh, and so it makes it more excretable. And then we excrete it in the, in the urine or uh, breathe it out uh, in, the, uh, in the lungs. And so this is the general scheme for a toxic metabolism. This is what's happening in the liver that we see. So you have uh, toxins, uh, oftentimes they're lipid soluble. A lipid doesn't uh, like water. And so you have to change it, the, uh, the chemical makeup, so it likes water. That's what makes it excretable, because when we excrete urine, it's water. That's not, that's not fat, it's water. And so you have to change it a little bit. But whenever you change it uh, uh, by putting different chemicals on it, sometimes you make it more toxic, more toxic. That's a problem with this mechanism. Uh, and then, so the second phase is to, uh, is to detoxify the thing. Uh, you reduce the size of it so it can more likely be excreted. Uh, you ionize the thing. Uh, you uh, uh, make it water soluble so you can go, it can go out in the urine. This is what happens in the metabolism, getting ready for the excretion uh, to, uh, to occur. We have another question for you, Dr. Johnson. They say, we hear a lot about detox diets lately. Are there harmful, or are there actually harmful toxins stored in our bodies, and are these diets effective at reading the body of them? Uh, okay, um, well, it's hard to say. I would say both of those. Uh, 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 I would think that it's more likely that uh, when, whenever you're eating food, you're taking in toxins. <clears throat> and so you could have things that would tie up the toxins in there as well. You know, uh, there's, uh, you can have uh, clay components. A lot of countries are using clay in their supplements uh, because that ties up the toxin, like uh, microtoxins uh, that, that occurs. And then a drought period, our corn has mold on it, had microtoxins on it, and then we feed it to the cattle or whatever, it gets sick. But if you have clay in it, it can bind it up. So these things are probably working on the same way, is they're tying up what you're eating, not so much what's in there. Uh, but there, I wouldn't say there's no case of where it's not trying to go in there to uh, absorb something to, uh, to, to tie it up. Uh, even antibodies can tie up toxins. And so that's one of the things it does is it, it ties it up so it doesn't attach and do uh, its damage is what, uh, is what it, it, it does. So I don't really know that much about it, but that's, that's uh, what, what, I, what I think about it. Uh, if we look at um, uh, what is toxicity, uh, what's the effects it has on the body, uh, and then also the organs that are affected, uh, we can see some toxins cause toxicity uh, from uh, using normal function. And usually that's the way disease works. Uh, it, it's not, uh, even cancer 
uh, is cell division, and cell division is important. In your gut, you uh, change the lining of your gut every six days. Okay, so you can't stop cell division, and so in the case of cancer, it doesn't stop when it should. You have starts and stops, and it doesn't stop. But it's a normal process, and that's what happens here. Maybe it binds to uh, uh, enzymes. So if the toxin binds to an enzyme, the enzyme is not available to do its job. Maybe it binds to DNA. It binds to DNA, and you can't uh, transcribe the DNA. Uh, and so uh, uh, you, you're going to maybe have a mutation uh, to occur. So it could either be the proteins that the DNA produce, it could be the DNA itself, it could be the membrane, lipids. It interferes with uh, lipids, it binds to lipids, and prevent them from making a membrane uh, like it should be. Uh, also, it can combine with oxygen and make uh, a ra a free radicals, which are toxic uh, to, the, to uh, both lipid, uh, protein, uh, as well as the, the DNA. Now, what are some of the effects? Death. You could die. <laughs> That's what happened with Socrates, right? Arsenic, uh, cyanide, it will kill you. Uh, Agent, we see uh, uh, the organ damage uh, could be like uh, different organ. Uh, this is the, uh, that, that you can see, uh, ozone. You can see the ozone area right there, kind of in blue of the earth. It can damage the ozone. Uh, it can also, uh, UV light can cause uh, uh, mu uh, mutations to occur. It can cause cancer. That's another thing that can occur. Uh, also, teratogenesis, it can cause your offspring to have an effect uh, is, uh, is, is what it can occur too. And it seems like there's a toxin for every organ. For the nervous system, lead. You've heard of lead poisoning and don't want kids to eat uh, lead and uh, you've heard about the lead in the water and all that stuff. Uh, also the immune system, uh, the liver, ethanol, not that good. Alcohol is not good. Uh, the respiratory system, tobacco, we know that. Asbestos, bad, bad for us. And what happens to asbestos is is that uh, the, the, the macrophages, uh, the cell, the garbage trucks of the cell that cleans the, 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 the lungs up, it can't break down asbestos. So one cell starts to eat asbestos, and then another macrophage says, hey, look, you're not doing your job. I'm going to eat you. And so you finally, everybody eats up everybody, and so you close up the airspace. So you can't hear the air exchange. That's what happens with asbestos. Uh, UV in the light of your eye uh, is uh, it's, it's problematic. Why you want to have UV detectors on your glasses if you have to? Metals in the lungs, very bad. Skin, UV light, nickel, and the reproductive tract, it seems like every tract, every place has some toxins that can get to it. What about toxicologists? Before we move on to toxicologists, we have another question. The, the students would like to know, if a person loses a portion of their liver or one kidney, how does the body compens compensate to remove toxins? Okay, if you, uh, the liver can regenerate. And so you have different lobes of the liver and they can regenerate back. So that can fix itself. Uh, okay, uh, that is if, if the liver is not damaged uh, with, uh, 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 with, uh, with like cholesterol uh, induced problems, then uh, it, can, uh, it can go back. So you can take a little bit of liver out and it's still okay. You can take one kidney out and be okay too, but what you have to do is kind of change your behavior a little bit. Maybe, uh, 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 maybe eat more often. Uh, uh, maybe uh, drink uh, more often, something like that. You have to do that, but you can still uh, get rid of the toxins, but uh, there's never two of anything. It's not the same as having two kidneys. So it is uh, problematic, but it's not a totally life-threatening uh, mm -hmm. if you remove that and a liver can can regenerate so if we talk about the uh, and how do I know that because toxicologists have done things what did they do most toxicologists work on mechanisms in other words uh, uh, processes that goes on in the body to understand how it works if you understand how it works then you can manipulate the system either avoid it or uh, you could use it to your advantage. They also teach. They teach about how to do experiments. They think about how toxicology affects our daily lives. They teach. That's what they do. Uh, toxicologists also develop safer chemical products. That's what they do. 
to try to produce safer drugs. Those that have less side effects, okay? They want to detect and determine the risk of chemical exposures, of plant exposures. That's what they do. Uh, they uh, develop treatment for chemicals and they teach. Other toxicologists, they teach students, they teach their dean, uh, they teach to, uh, everybody you. That's what we're trying to do right here. Uh, remember when we define toxicology? Toxicology is science concerned with the nature, effects, and detection of poisons, and that's what toxicologists do. They do those type things to work on understanding those things which are the, the different pillars of toxicology. Mechanistic ones, they want to understand what mechanism makes it work. How do I excrete this faster? And of course, one of those things would be vomiting, as someone mentioned uh, to occur. And so uh, you do that, maybe this is an academic setting, maybe this is in the government that's doing that. Also the descriptive one, they want to know you make a new plant, uh, a new product, or maybe you combine some plants to do something, uh, how toxic is it? And so that's a descriptive type thing. You want to know how toxic uh, something might be. Or maybe it's a clinical toxicologist. So you want to uh, look at it, induce vomiting, whatever you want to do, uh, uh, so it would be more clinically related to the toxicology. Based on exposure, what type of antidote would you use? Uh, based on what kind of snake you got bitten, what kind of antivenin you would, you would use. Also, forensic toxicologists, yeah, they work with the law. So they use toxins to, uh, to determine whether something was exposed or something. I remember I said it could be exact, uh, accidental or deliberate, and so uh, that's what toxicologists do. There's also environmental toxicologists. They're worried about the ecosystem. They're worried about the water in Flint, Michigan, right? Uh, environmental toxicology. There's also regulatory ones. They're in the EPA, the FDA, and maybe these are all job opportunities that you guys uh, could apply for. Could be industry, could be private industry, could be government, uh, could be university, or whatever it could, it could be. Now toxicologists uh, are used a lot of times because maybe the individual wants to a campaign against something. Recycle something, they're saying, okay? Maybe they want to do that. But sometimes you need to get the government involved. Sometimes you have to get the EPA, NIOSH. NIOSH has to do with safety of workers uh, involved uh, in the process. So don't think you can do all this alone. You can get uh, some government agencies uh, to be involved to help you. Now, a toxicology, as you know, is a science of study of harmful things. That's what it is. A and a career in toxicology uh, could involve evacuating mechanisms of where chemicals work and how to manipulate the system or how to prevent exposures. You could do that, okay? And then, so toxicology uh, routinely use sophisticated uh, scientific methods to detect things. That's what they do. And so they're always wanting, there's a whole group I'm trying to develop more uh, tests to detect things. I remember the first guy had to eat the poison. And then now, we, as we develop more tests, uh, the scientist is independent of the study uh, that, 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 that they're doing. We have another question, Dr. Johnson. The okay. students would like to know, how do toxicologists determine the right dose of a chemical to treat a disease and not poison the individual? Okay, that's a good point because dose makes the poison, and you can be a toxicology to a toxicologist to test that. You can. So what they do is uh, they take uh, different dosages. Uh, they would take out a dose, a heaviest dose, and then they would dilute it out with water or with something. And so they had different concentrations. So uh, so on a graph, you would have a graph like this. This would be the concentrations. This would be the least zero, this would be the amount that you know would kill something. And you can do this with snake venom. You can take different amounts, the pure venom, 50%, uh, 10%, 2%, 1%, like this, and inject it into rats or something, and you will discover that a certain dose will start killing the rats. Uh, before that time, it won't kill them. And so uh, that's how they 
come up with, uh, with what the dose would be. And they do that with, uh, usually with some kind of modeling first, uh, computer modeling, and then with cells next, and then with animals, uh, and then ultimately they have to do it with the humans as well. But by then they will already know what is a dose that would be. And they will always start out with something less and less and less until they got uh, the positive effect uh, that, 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 that they wanted. And the point is that you could be a toxicologist too. You could be a toxicologist too. And so I, I trust that you learned a few little things, maybe how to define the word toxicology and what are some of the sources of toxicants maybe uh, state some of the history. Remember chemotherapy? Remember father of uh, modern toxicology? Uh, and then also uh, uh, define some of the effects that occur and some of the body organs that were affected. It seemed like all the organs were affected, right? Uh, and then uh, some occupations, rubber workers, uh, 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 even uh, healthcare workers, environmental hazards, uh, if you were in a place where you could get sting or whatever. And then uh, discuss fundamental rules. Maybe you have to be exposed first to be, uh, and also concepts about how you clear and how it goes on. Routes of exposure, remember you can eat it, you can smell it, uh, you can uh, uh, get it through your skin, uh, and other, it can be injected like a mosquito. That's how you get malaria, right? is different routes of exposure and toxicologists, what they do. And they do some things. They all, these are some people that gave us the information back in 2,202 that we see. Uh, 2002, I should say. Okay, we have another question before you move on. Um, we have, let's see, it's Heritage Academy this time wants to know, is venom from a living creature different from other chemical poisons other than how it is taken into the body? Well, uh, a, a, a poisonous compound, a toxicant, is a xenobiotic, and those are different. So the chemical nature of it would be a little bit different uh, for, like, say, one snake versus another snake. There different kinds of snakes would have different uh, different ones, and that would be different than what's in poison ivy. It would be. But, uh, but they still would have a common, uh, a, a, a common thread uh, that it would affect one cell or another cell or another cell. Uh, it, it, and, and you would have different cells affected. That's why there are different organs affected by different chemicals. It's because uh, uh, they are different susceptibilities of the different organs that can occur. But yeah, as we saw, different organs were affected by different chemicals. That would imply that the chemicals themselves are a little bit different. So the xenobiotics are many uh, uh, that can cause toxicity of, of one kind or another. We probably have time for maybe one more question, and, and the question is, are some routes of exposure more difficult for the body to recover from than others? I guess like maybe ingesting versus breathing versus touching your skin. Uh, uh, usually, uh, <coughs> it's, it's hard to say because it all depends upon what is injected in. Uh, the, uh, the routes of exposure, usually once in something that's injected or swallowed, it's hard to get it out. And so that would be more problematic, but I don't know if it's absorbed through your skin, it would be hard to get it out too. So I'm not sure exactly uh, uh, what the answer to that question would be if I didn't know what the specific chemicals were where you're absorbing it through inhalation or you're absorbing it through, uh, through, the, through the skin. Okay, so uh, this is just some travels of a toxicologist. You can see where I went to Qatar, Holland, China, Japan. And if you look at that little boy's T-shirt on the bottom part, it's the middle of the bottom. You can see he's got a Texas A&M shirt on of all universities in the world. And over on the bottom right, that's Stockholm, Sweden, where every scientist wants to go because that's where they get the Nobel Prize. It's where they want to go. So is there any more questions? 
I think that's it. Okay, well, thank you guys for uh, listening. I hope that helped you with a little bit of toxicology, and thank you for your questions. Very good questions to be able to, uh, uh, to ap appreciate that some things were getting out. All right, thanks again for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you next week when we discover um, decoding, uh, no, that's not next week. Next week is uh, looking at the biological clock, and we'll look forward for to seeing you there next week. If you'd like to learn more about STEM or veterinary science or careers in STEM and veterinary science, we invite you to visit our website. It's peer.tamu.edu. Thanks for joining us today, and we'll see you next time.